Happy Sunday, apprentices. So, you're making profit now. You're uh, the world's best trader, raining in profits every week. Do you just keep letting it ride? Or do you have a plan with something else to do with that profit? That's what's next on today's show. Trading Forex or any other financial instrument carries substantial risk. The topics discussed on this show are the views of the host and the producers only. You should consult with your financial planner before investing in Forex or any other financial instrument. Don't be a dumbass. Welcome to Day Trading Plumber, episode 41. I'm Matt Simpson, and we are in a closet. We are in the new office. Might as well be a closet. Well, you know, I packed a L-shaped desk, bookcase, two tables for the podcasting, a couch. Uh, next week, there'll be some some more sound denting material. I have to shimmy like Brad Pitt in Fight Club just to get around in this place. It is kind of hot, you know? Four monitors, lights. Matt won't let me have the ceiling fan on because it makes noise. But uh, I kind of like it. It's You know, I was really looking forward to getting productive this week. Got the office set up and windows. Thank you, uh, Bill Gates. Forced an update on my desktop. It's the best. And uh, what you know, updated, restarted, and now it won't run really pissed me off because I was like I just I had the kids over the weekend just dropped them off I was like I gotta put this desk together and guess what I'm productive again after this two three week move and then you went to the store you didn't call Matt you got the wrong thing you should have called Matt yeah well I thought I got the right stuff so you've made some money now what do you do I want to share with our listeners the extracurricular things I do with the profits I make from my Forex trading accounts. Obviously not this week, having a rough week. Uh, it is not uh, the week I was hoping for. However, I'm still distracted and I could blame it on that. But, you know, when you're a reversion of the mean trader and uh, it looks like the NZD, AUD, and possibly the Euro are racing back to their pre-COVID levels in a hurry. It's uh, not a good week. And, you know, we covered that in the live Ask Me Anything event a couple hours ago with the people in the journeyman group. And I couldn't ask for a better group of individuals. It's it's taken off quite nicely. It'd be nice if we doubled and tripled the numbers every week financially, but you know, I get it. You know, middle of a move, we're not focusing that hard on adding people, just trying to make sure we add value. You know, the last 10 years, I mean, there's going to come a time if you're one of the, the few percentile of people who don't blow their account up settle into a consistent way of making gains and you know there's going to come that point and we've talked about this many times before where there's going to come the time where you're going to have to make the decision am I comfortable with a hundred grand of risk capital in a high risk high return for X count is it 500 grand is it a million? A lot of people out there dream of having a million dollar Forex count. I've traded a million dollar Forex count. I built it up to that. But once I hit a million, that was my my mark. What did I do with the profits every month or week? Right? You got to come up with that plan before you get there. For me, it was, okay, I'll trade a million dollar count at the end of each month. I will pull those profits I made out only if 
now it becomes more of the style of trader you are. And we all know I carry I carry inventory. I carry a lot of open trades, especially with the robot. I have a checklist. If drawdown's in check within ranges, I'm relatively low on lots of open orders. That kind of gives me the okay I could pull that profit out that month. And then when I say pull it out, I just move it out of my MT4 trading account and I put it in my primary account, which makes it accessible to transfer it to your bank, transfer it to another MT4 account. Maybe you're a trend trader on a different account or you're trading different styles and you're wanting to keep your data separated. A lot of traders do, right? I, I have an R&D broker account, research and development account where I test different strategies. It's smaller. A lot of us would like to test live trading because it's real money, different strategies. So today I want to talk about all the different things you can do when you're making money. If you do make profits, what are some outside trading things we can do? One of the things I do is I safeguard at least 10, 15% in my primary account. And if you trade MT4 or at least the broker I use, you have a primary account, which means you can have a balance on it that's outside the market. It's transferable in seconds. It's like a money market. Right, so. It's like a money market account on Ameritrade. Right. A lot of those brokers will charge you for idle money or you could even earn interest on some of them. My broker, you don't get interest or charged and it's just sitting there idle. Now, what's great about that is say we have a week like this week. I'm like right up against the wall. My back is against the ropes. I'm running out of free margin. I want to trade, but I can't. Or... I want to give my open positions more room, but I can't. And I have this anxiety, right? We were talking about it before we start recording. Do I close some of these trades? Do I wait it out? I mean, I'm so close to the ropes that I'm just on an island. Now, if I had that idle money, 10, 15, 20%, you're going to have to work that out amongst yourself. And you're still confident in some of those positions which I'm not, by the way, <laughs> you can inject that money within a push of a button into your trading account. And then all of a sudden now you've given yourself more room or more, more risk capital to continue to trade. So like with my robot account, there's months where I don't pull out the profit and I just leave it in there because I need a little extra room to keep the robot unpaused or... I'm paused because I'm in a defensive mode and I'm putting that idle money back in or leaving that profit in to just give myself a little bit more room. So that's one thing you, you can strategize and, it, and probably should be the first thing you strategize once you start getting consistent gains. Okay, should I put some money aside and, you know, like I said, this all depends on the style of trader you are. If you're a scalper and you're in and out and you don't carry positions very long, what good is idle money? You're not going to get into the situations that I'm in this week where you carry positions, you let positions move against you because you use rollovers or you're patient enough to wait them out. This is the those kind of weeks where you want to second guess everything you do as a trader because you're like, oh, I could go a little bit more. I could go a little bit more. And then the next thing you know, you're like, holy crap, I'm 50% drawdown. I don't have much free margin and I'm on an island. No one likes being stuck on an island without a any kind of motor or ore. You're literally sitting there waiting for price to come back or you're going to close. And it's not fun. Well, you had to tell that guy today who inquired about my FX book. 
Yeah. I mean, I had a interested fellow plumber reach out. Another Brit, right? Yep. From across the pond. He reached out. His fellow plumber obviously knows he's been trading a while, interested in my FX book data. And, you know, he was like, look, uh, you only have a couple of mo- oh, a couple of weeks worth of data, which we started this journeyman channel a couple of weeks ago, you know, and was seeking out more information. And he's like, and by the way, you're in serious drawdown. This doesn't look good. And I was like, yeah, you're right. You caught me on a bad week. We started this journeyman channel six, seven weeks ago, but. Yeah, I just told him, I was like, look, man, trading, this is trading. I'm a real dude. I have bad weeks. I'm still adjusting to trading such a small balance and adjusting to the trade sizes that fit that balance. We're in the choppy waters. We make 10% one week. Uh, We go flat. I give a little bit back. Now I'm stuck in super high drawdown, more than I like. And, you know, the guy called me out on it, which is good. And, you know, my response was, I'm a real human. Most of my net worth is being traded on a robot. But the only publicly shared uh, account is the Journeyman channel right now. The one that I am uh, charging people to get access to. And I truly feel like if you're going to charge money to sell signals or any other, you're going to take money for people. You should have data. You should have historical data for them to make the proper decisions. I just try to be as open and honest as possible. And yes, this is a bad week to look at. Hey, does this guy know what he's doing or not? But what I'm trying to do is be as real as possible. And you know, if I take this big gouging loss, it's not like, Uh, I haven't taken them before and it's not like most of our listeners or anyone who's been in trading hasn't done it before. And then we just work on the comeback and you know, it's not like I'm going to, I told him, I was like, I really want to just add money, change the, my FX book and just start over. But we can't do that in real life. And you know, if I have to take this loss and I lose more than 50% of my account and then my FX book link looks like crap for the next nine months. Dude, you're losing, you're, you're negative. That's trading. There's times where you got to climb out of the hole. And what I'm trying to provide with the podcast, the free content I put out there soon to be the courses that I'm trading, you know, the trading courses What I'm trying to do is bring a realism to trading because there's so much fakeness in this industry. The people who are really good at boasting about how good they are and how they're the world's best trader, how they don't go through personal problems that affect and they got the Ferrari in their trading room. That is not it. We're stewardess. We're flight attendants. We're plumbers were the guy who got laid off at Office Depot because COVID and has 10 grand and wants to start a new opportunity. That is the majority of us in this world. And when we get into trading. That's certainly all of us in the community channel. Right. When we get into trading, it doesn't go perfect. And not every week is going to be perfect. And we get ourselves in these scenarios. And what I'm trying to do is, you know, I got myself in trouble. I started trading a really small balance account right when I was going through a lot of personal issues. We uh, did very well a couple weeks. And uh, we've had some flat weeks. Overall, if you look at the balance, I'm still ahead. But if you look at the equity curve, it's atrocious. Is that a word? I'm not going to shy away from it or hide from it and try to act like it's not real. It is. 
And but we all go through this. And you know, if I have to shift gears and be like, "Hey, I know uh the my FX book shows that I'm a loser." Guess what? So what? We're going to climb out of that hole cuz I've done this over and over. I've taken big losses, I've taken small losses, and I've had big wins. And I'm not going to, you know, lie and say it's not affecting me. But I also got to look in the rearview mirror and be like, dude, you're going through a separation. You just moved. You're working out a schedule with your kids. Still adjusting to being a full-time trader and working from home and not having, you know, people around. But man, this is this is the real deal. This is life. And, you know, back to the point of the show, you know, things I've done over the years with the profit I've made over the last decade, which has allowed me to be a full-time trader, I didn't go, I'm not all in on Forex. I've moved a lot of that profit I've made over the years into other investment vehicles, real estate, long-term investment in equities. I have a money manager guy. You know, I talk bad about them, right? But they are valuable. They help you diversify. They help you get into income equities and bonds and all these things that are good to be in when you're in volatile times. It's just like any other business. If you owned 10 Taco Bells, you might in the beginning of it be pretty over levered, over levered and have a lot of that on loans, a lot of it, you know, your cash flow, you have a bank that's helping you out with cash flow. But once you start making profit out of those 10 Taco Bells, what are you doing with that profit? You're investing in your kids' college funds, you're putting that money away somewhere. Trading's no different. Just because you you are a great day trader, swing trader, forex trader, doesn't mean you ignore diversifying those that risk and those assets once you make them. It's no different. I forget where the quote comes from. Pardon me. But you should have five to six different income or revenue streams. So you're protected in times like this. That's a concept I did not get when I traded my time for money as a plumber in my early years. I always knew I wanted to invest. We hear it, but let's just face it. It takes a lot of education, mental you know, you have to be motivated, just like becoming a plumber. You don't just say, uh, I want to be a plumber because they make good money and it happens overnight. It doesn't. It's a lifetime type endeavor. So what are these other investment vehicles? We mentioned real estate. So real estate seems like a very easy type vehicle to get into. However, it, it does carry risk. If you're my age, which I'm 41 now, you've gone through two pretty decent dips in the market. And the 2008 one was primarily real estate, which before that, everyone I ever talked to is like, dude, you just buy a house. Five years later, it's worth 30% more. You sell it. You roll that back in. It's like a sure deal. Well, not necessarily, but real estate is a very good investment vehicle, mostly because banks are willing to partner with you at a pretty low interest rate, threes, low fours. And to do it correctly, you got to put 20% down and you could correct me if I'm wrong, Matt. Uh, if you buy a investment property, you need at least 20% of that. It's not like you could get a VA, VA loan and 0% down on an investment property. 
uh, unless you're pretty creative and you live in it for two years. If you have 20%, what you could have accumulated through your trading, and you partner with a bank, you know, very you know, three, 4% interest, and you put a renter in there, that's a great income property. Because theoretically, that property is going to gain in value over time. And if someone is paying the cost plus that 3% you're paying the bank through that rental income and a little bit more, which by the way, you should probably save for reinvesting in that property, not spending it. It's not a bad way to park your money because I, I kind of view it as where do you park your capital and you kind of look at the risk side trading let's just call it a little bit higher risk real estate still has risk but if you if you buy right you could park your money and it could grow obviously you're not going to make 50 percent a year uh unless you're in really good times but you could park your money and it's going to grow over time and it's relatively safe another investment vehicle equities yeah, you know, we talked about Boeing, which is a rocket ship right now. Might as well have been on the the SpaceX. I bought at one hundred two. I bought at eighty nine. Which you heard it first here on this podcast. <laughs> well, we had we had been watching it for a couple months before we bought it. Right. I mean, it was one of those position trades. You just watched. You watched planes fall out of the sky. You watched. You watched even Iran try to blame Boeing for shooting him down, right? I mean, we, you just know America is not going to let Boeing die. Then COVID happens right when it looks like, oh, uh, you know, they, they might approve the planes. I think COVID's the best thing that happened to Boeing. It took the media off of it, the focus. No one is that worried about a, a plane falling out of the, the sky as much as getting COVID or now getting your, you know, windows bashed in with these riots. Boeing's just a rocket ship. I think uh, we found the bottom, Matt. Hopefully some of our listeners thought so too, because, you know, when I was saying Boeing publicly, people are like, you mean the company that is killing people? I mean, it's that, that perfect cliche we always hear. When people are running from something, that's when you need to start looking at running to it. What's great about position trades like Boeing? It's a decent dividend. Yeah, what, six? Right now it's at four and three quarters. Four and three quarter. So you're going to make four and three quarter percent. If you, just hold your, if you just hold your money. And if you bought it, I, I think the mark I was saying was $100. Which is right when I bought Which it. Which is, believe it or not, guys, the market has, the mark it's, excuse me, because Forex follows this too. The markets have their own emotions. And emotional levels are even numbers. Because humans are emotional. Let's just call a spade a spade. A lot of the markets are human, even though more and more AI and ETFs and machines are trading. But even numbers, if you go back and look at charts, price tends to reverse near even numbers. So that's why it was really easy to go. Boeing, let's just say a hundred, a hundred dollars a share. And as a position trade, and remember, on a position trade, you're not trying to be a sniper and find the exact, oh, ah, got to be perfect within a tick or two. No. It's just like GBP USD with Brexit. It was pretty obvious where that turn was going to happen. But I believe it was like 1.10. If I had the chart, I could tell you. But. Everyone was targeting that even number bottom. And once I hit there, probably the best position trade of 2020, 
because GBP hit that and just went up. So even numbers, but equities, position trades, great way. If you're a, a successful Forex trader, it's a great way when you pull your profits out, find these bottoms. And, and guys, I know you can short equities. I know you could do call options and, and put options. But it's really easy with a Robinhood account, which they're not sponsoring this podcast. They should. <laughs> do you like that plug? I do. Uh, but you can open a Robinhood account with no commissions and just buy. You could buy companies like Boeing. You could buy Apple. You could buy Microsoft. It was really scary during this COVID to think bullish, but man, it's really easy to look back now and be like, I could have made 36% just on the S S and P in a month or two month and a half. I'm a huge fan of uh, CDs, which is certificate of deposit, but I haven't been for about 10 years. I remember as a kid, 16, 17, when I was cleaning cars at budget, running car at the airport. Budget rent a car. And I was working serious hours, 80 to 100 hours OT in the summer, which was good. I stayed out of a lot of trouble just by working. I would dump money into 6 and 7% CDs 12 months, right? And now I won't even waste my time. Right well, now, I just looked it up. Right now, one year APY top is 1.3%. And that's a Goldman Sachs for CD. That's not even worth your time because... If real inflation is three three percent and nominal inflation is four percent, right? It's, it's you're losing a, money. You're losing money. It's a complete waste of time. Your opportunity cost is outweighed by what you're getting. Well, and they lock or, your or money up. Your opportunity cost outweighs your return. If they lock your money up. You have to pay a fee to get it back to do other investment vehicles. Right. It's a damn shame because it's a total waste of time. Here's one for you: minimum deposit. At TIAA Bank, five grand for one point three percent one year APY. You're locking up five grand to get one percent. Why even bother? Well, I think some equities brokers now pay you more than that for idle money for their money market account. That's so right. it's like, put it in the money market account, make as much as you're doing on CD. But if you find a a, a win like Boeing, you can invest in it. People don't take the time to educate themselves just a little bit. One year treasury bill. You want to hear that rate? Yeah. A one year. Mm -hmm. What do you think? So it is? money's locked up for a year. Correct. Federal government money. You're, uh, you're buying debt. You're buying debt and it's backed by the federal government. Yep. Uh, 4%. 0. 0.17. <laughs> it's not even, uh, but it's safe. For a 52 week T bill. What What's we're the 10 year bond? What we're saying is those are typical. Now, T bills and T bonds are different, right? Yeah. What we're saying is those are typical vehicles. Those are traditional vehicles that have been shot to hell. 30 year treasury bond, 1.46. Jesus. What is the point? Well, <sighs> give me an example of why I would have a 30 year treasury bond at 1.46. The only thing that I can think of, well, excuse me, there are two. The first is when when we decide it's all over and they go to negative interest rates and they start punishing people for saving money, okay? The other is you have 30 million in capital that has nothing to do and you just, you, you dump 10 million of it and you forget about it and it's part of, right? it's part of, uh, or you've been burned before and you're like, I need something foolproof. And it, and you've just given up at that point ever seeing it and it's it's part of your estate. It's in your will, right? Right. I can't think, can you think of another reason why you would ever have a 30-year treasury bond at 1.46%? Yeah, unless you just have endless capital and you got to park it somewhere, right? And it's kind of like, just go here so I don't have to think about it, right? I'm making something. And it's really not going to hurt me. <laughs> Another great thing that I've done in the past is, you know, 
I've done stupid stuff that have actually made money. I have a hobby. I like to refinish furniture. So I'll go buy furniture super cheap, spend a little bit of labor, not a lot, but you're not going to turn a lot. But with a really small trading account, if you're making $50 a week and you're at that level, right? Because let's just face it. A lot of our listeners, a lot of people that reach out to us are trading 1000 to $10,000 accounts. Don't get me wrong. I have a, a large pool of people that are trading ten to $500,000 accounts as well. But majority of them are in that small range. And if you have a $10,000 account and you make $50 a week and you don't want to go past $10,000 account, what could you do with that $50 a week that could help still grow that money? Well, find a, a desk for $20, refinish it, modernize it, sell it for 200 right? These are things you can easily do. Now, imagine if you risked $50 on a trade and you made 200 It's great returns. And these little things are huge. I took a desk that someone literally left at our mailbox. There was no free sign on it. It was like someone thought the mailbox was the trash dump. It had, I remember picking it up. My wife's like, what are you going to do with that? It's trash. It was like this. It was decently built antique table. Sanded it down. Cost me 50 cents in sanding pads for the little orbital sander. I was watching my kids drive their little electric Jeep around the cul de sac while I sanded it. Uh, I went and got some flat white paint with the wax. I'd never done it before, but I watched a YouTube video, took a half hour to watch it. Uh, flat white with wax, distressed. You know, I painted it all up. I got $3 hardware. And Within a day and a half, I had a table, looked antique, tightened up all the things, and I probably could have sold it for 200, 150, 200 bucks to the perfect buyer if you have a way to get it out, which, by the way, Facebook Marketplace, come on. You could be in 100 groups within a 50-mile radius of you posted. Everything I've posted on there, I've sold within you know, a week. And usually you got a bargain, you know, people are going to bargain down price, but $50, ta you know, free table, spend maybe $50 in material and uh, a day and a half of me babysit the kids. That's something you could easily do with these small accounts. Then what do you do with that 200 bucks? You roll it back into the trading account and you could do this back and forth. Next thing you know, you're no longer a flight attendant. You're trading a hundred thousand dollar account, making fifty grand or a hundred grand a year in all of these other revenue streams. Is there a value to be had in taking that fifty dollars that you spent that you could have spent on a trade and giving away from watching your phone, watching your positions, watching the charts, trusting the trades that you're already in? or moving your mind from your positions and then putting another $200 back into it? Is that, does that heal you at all? Well, take for instance, these last few weeks where I've been massively distracted. It's been kind of nice not being glued to the charts, but because I'm a full-time trader and it's my career, I'm still watching them, but I get this anxiety like, oh, I'm not, I'm not doing my job. Especially when, you know, like this week, positions are moving further and further against us. And I kind of am sitting there going, how come I'm so able to ignore when positions are moving against me and just let it happen? Then when I have profitable trades, the anxiety is 10 times more when I have a trade that's profitable and I'm trying to sniper the perfect uh, the perfect take profit or get out 
And, you know, a lot of us traders deal with that. I personally have more anxiety when I have profitable trades on than losing ones. And, you know, I'm not the only one. It's, I guess, clinically known that we're much more apt to hold on to losing trades longer than to let our winners run. It's no secret. And that's, you know, it's something all of us traders are constantly working on. And, you know, I've adapted my, my trading style to be, you know, I don't mind taking chip shots. You know, I don't mind bunt hits as long as I get on base. And it's always about just base hits. When trades move against me, I'll let it go pretty far against me. And then like weeks like this week, you go, damn it. I wish I didn't do that. But, you know, to answer your question, I don't take money out and reinvest it somewhere else in a losing situation to take a break. It's usually when I'm on a roll and I'm making good gains, I store that money away for weeks like this, right? Where I could just eject capital, outlive the wave. A lot of people, when they're in this situation... It's kind of like going to get that extra $1,000 out of the ATM when you've been gambling in Vegas and you're out of your risk, the capital you told yourself, oh, I'm going to gamble $1,000 this five days I'm in Vegas. And when it's gone, I'm done. That is why you need a beer account. Your beer fund should be labeled sports and beer. That's what mine is labeled. A cut from my daily job goes there every week and then a cut from a big win when i withdraw goes there and that's my that's my fun capital you have risk capital you have fun capital fun capital emergency fund and i never let it get past a certain point when it does when it grows i move it and that's my discipline for if i go on a bender or decide i really really need something and that's my cash account yeah, I mean, uh, when I took the trip to Florida, there was a Hard Rock Casino open. So we're like, we got to go. And, you know, I'm probably 50-50 with gambling. Vegas just opened their casinos, by the way. Oh, go did on. they? Yeah, today. Watch the stocks jump, by the way. Mm -hmm. So I go. Really weird. Plexiglass, block, you know, they thermal scan, but packed you know, people just waiting to lose money. It's great. And, you know, I probably, well, I know I lost 2500 bucks, And I told myself, oh, I'll get $1,000 out. <laughs> and when it's gone, hopefully it's by the end of the night. And, dude, it was like, it's almost like they had the machines and everything set up. And, uh, you know, my favorite game was is three-card poker. And they had this new game called Four Card Poker. Hold on now. Is that for the more advanced counters? Do you find that it's easier to count three cards? Well, it's not so much counting, but Four Card Poker, the dealer gets six cards, you get four, and they get to make their best hand out of six cards. And I didn't know That's this. Fair. I didn't know this before I played. Of course not. And it, it, and it was a $25 minimum. You and I play all three lines. You didn't open a demo account? No. You just jumped right <laughs> I, in? I jumped right in. I didn't open a demo account. And by the time I was like, wait a minute. Why do you got six cards? I get four. They're like, well, I get six. And I'm like, dude, I, I just... Basically donated 400 bucks before I realized what was happening. Sounds like a good play, dude. So then I take, I go, I'm going to go over to my trusty blackjack. And I actually did quite well the first 20 minutes, right? I made back that 400 bucks I lost. So now I'm feeling good. Yeah, my, my strategy's working, right? Just like us traders. Bets started getting bigger. And lost a couple in a row. The next thing you know, the thousand bucks is gone. And I'm like, all right, I'll go get another thousand. <laughs> <laughs> I take that thousand dollars. Most of the night was on that thousand dollars. 
But I find Game of War, which is probably your best odds in any casino, if they let you play War, that's where you should play. I made back 800 of that original $1,000 I lost and then uh, got stupid, probably because had a few too many drinks at this point and lost the second thousand dollars I went in, and then I went and got five hundred. Made that last the rest of the night. That sounds about right. But pretty much went home with like sixty bucks. Let's get off gambling and get and move into another option we have as traders. A lot of people don't know this, but you can trade an IRA. Self directed IRA. Self directed IRA. Now I'm not condoning moving your entire retirement account. But a lot of my trading funds, I'm doing pre-taxed, meaning if it's an IRA, not a Roth IRA, and you can trade it in Forex, and your profits don't get taxed till you retire. Just like when you work as a plumber or a carpenter and you're, you're giving 6%, hopefully you're putting away as much as your company's matching, otherwise you're just wasting a benefit opportunity cost right but you can trade that now you can't do an active 401k which i get asked all the time like hey uh i still work at the company and i want to trade it no it needs to be an ira whether an old one from a former employer or uh one you started with cash now let's say you have 10 20 grand cash or 10 20 grand pre-taxed that you need to put somewhere. Well, you can put it in self-directed IRA and then you can trade it. Now, a lot of our listeners are small business owners, plumbers, snake and drains, electrician has a small company. You can defer your profits from your small business and put it into a self-directed IRA. And I'm not going to talk about the levels, but you could put a certain amount of funds away as a small business owner into your retirement account as an IRA and you could trade it. You could follow my signals. You can take my courses. You can learn how to trade that IRA just like a retirement. You don't have to worry about paying taxes on it until you retire. So that's another investment vehicle, another angle that a lot of people don't know is out there. If you want more information on it, you want me to walk you through it, Jump on over to allenfx.com, fill out the form, set up a chat with me. I'll tell you how I do it because I'm a small business owner. I have trading business. I have, you know, other revenue streams that I like to hide from tax man until I retire. I also have my kids' college funds that I trade. Short side note. Tax avoidance and tax evasion are not the same. No. The Laffer curve teaches us that there is a maximum rate, about 28% of government revenue based on tax rates. And what that means is the higher the tax rate, the more money people are going to spend on accountants legally, okay, we're talking about legal ways to do this, to avoid paying taxes. And it's the tolerance, right? And I just want to make the point that tax avoidance and tax evasion are not the same. Do you remember how Al Capone got taken down? Tax evasion. That's correct. That's usually how some of those big black market money makers get taken down. Running an IRA fund as well as a cash fund. Obviously, I have to have a cash account if you're going to live off of your profits, right? If you're a full-time trader, you have to work in, what is my, what's my monthly cost to live? And I'm going to have to make that in profit, pull it out, pay taxes on it, and then, uh, you know, live off of it. So you have to be very good budgeter because when you become a full-time trader, you got to have cash flow. I had a really interesting conversation this week with, well, actually, I had the same conversation three times this week with some of my colleagues. 
And I explained to them that you will find as you get older that being organized is just about the key. The problem is it takes a lot of effort to be organized. But at some point, your technical skill, that gets you to where you need to be. It gets you only so high. Unless, right. you're, unless of course, you're in a very technical profession. But being organized is how you get into management and how you start making really expensive decisions. Running a business is all about organization. Well, we talked about it. But right? you have to produce on the technical side, sure. You're not going to fail per se on the technical side. You're going to fail on poor organization. Well, we've talked about this before. You could go to school and become a dentist. You're a rabid anti-dentite. You're a doctor. You spent a lot of money. You delayed gratification to go to school. I wish I had the brains. A dentist, doctor, lawyer, you know, all these trades that take lots of schooling. And you go deep into drawdown, by the way. Let's put it in a trading term. What really paralyzes these individuals, they're told their whole life, oh, you're going to be a doctor. You're going to be rich. Oh, you're going to be a doctor showering in success. What most of them run up against, if they're not a natural entrepreneur, they're not a natural go-getter. They're super book smart. They are dedicated. They're disciplined, obviously. What they run up against is the doctors that make the most money run their own practice, which is running your own business. Or their own invention. Their own invention. They write books. They're personable. They do a podcast. They're on Nine News as the the medical correspondent, right? The subject matter expert. Right. I, I'm the, you know, they're Dr. Fauci, uh, you know, public speaking. All of these skills have nothing to do with medical. But to take a skill you have or have learned or have paid a, a great debt to, for instance, let's just talk about trading. If you're the world's best trader, you're going to be wealthy. But if you're the world's best trader and you have personality and you know how to teach other people and you know how to take your experiences, tell great stories and convert that into books and educational materials, you're going to be 50 times richer and wealthier. And, and probably happier. And probably happier because you're helping people. And, you know, that's kind of the path that I went down. I make plenty of money trading. Not lately. Not since I've had to divide my assets. But, uh, you know, it's just money. You'll make it back. I decided, what, two years ago, year and a half ago, start branching out. And, you know, the auto copy program was awesome. You know, I made some mistakes with the business plan. It was more out of, well, I just selfishly just want to trade my account. People want to tag along. Great. But I'm not going to spend any time educating them. They understand the risks. As long as I just trade well, it should work out well. Well, bad business plan. You bring people into trading they have no idea. You feel ultimately responsible if you're a good person like I am. When things go wrong, you feel guilty because you brought these people in. They had no idea what was going on. Even though majority of the time we were way ahead, bad times came and then uh, questions come. It just kind of turned into an experience that I didn't want. So then I moved into podcasting education, telegram channels, uh, you know, all the things that I'm doing now. And I, I'm really enjoying it because I feel like I'm really making a difference and I'm really reaching the right people now. It's hasn't turned the biggest corner yet as far as the trading goes, but it's going to be ups and downs. And, you know, the timing of a lot of this personal baggage Let's just call it baggage. Uh, it could have been worse. But at the end of the day, it's all adversity. And, you know, my all my years of being in construction, pivoting and adapting to schedule changes 
manpower changes, weather patterns. It's all part of the game. And there's just nothing out there that's going to be easy. In the community channel on Telegram, this week, last week, the week before, we have been discussing what is going on with the Dow, what's going on with the NASDAQ. And I got some validation. I got some confirmation bias. And markets are always forward-looking. They reflect optimism, and likewise, they reflect pessimism. And even though we're in a crazy state of affairs right now, traders are avoiding their emotions and reflecting their optimism as the economy starts to recover. Well, what's the economy? Simply put, it's just the exchange of goods and services. And as we know, the market is where those goods and services change hands. So what's happening is investments that you're seeing today Market action was already done before today because of projected optimism or projected pessimism. Now, I found this great article, and I'll put a link to it in the show notes. I'm going to read from it, from Forbes.com, written by Ann Sraders. What she did was she talked about how markets bounce back after national tragedy. In this case, it's international tragedy, but within the last week, it's been very intense national tragedy. Quote, after the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. in 1968, markets dipped briefly on the way on the day of his death, down 0.5% from April 4 to April 5, but rose roughly 3.5% by April 11, 1968. Now, that's a huge move in a week. Okay. Similarly, the riots following the acquittal of police officers who had beaten motorist Rodney King in 1992 didn't disrupt markets too dramatically, as the S&P 500 remained relatively flat from the beginning of riots on April 29 to May 1 and rose some 1.2% from April 29 through May 4. Again, a couple of days, 1.2%. That's a significant move. In 2014, the riots in Ferguson, Missouri, it's Missouri. Missouri. Yeah, Josie Wells, bud. Triggered by the fatal shooting of Michael Brown by police, prompted markets to fall only 0.16% on the Monday through Thursday following the start of protests on August 9, and saw markets gain 2.86% from August 11 through August 21, 2014. Tom Lee, head of research of Fundstrat Global Advisors, wrote, listen to this carefully, 1968 is a reminder that stocks and world events are not always connected. I honestly feel like equities it's always bullish don't get me wrong there's dips there's people that make a living off shorting but the people that short equities they're looking for base hits no one shorts long term they're looking for that company expected bad fundamentals right like that chick ceo who said uh, they could test everything with a blood drop. Oh, what was that? Biggest scam of all time, right? I mean, they're looking for those. But majority of investors are relatively bullish, right? They're buy and hold. Elizabeth Holmes. Right. Who should be in jail, hopefully. Theranos. Thanos? Theranos was the company, the company that right. she created. It was supposed to, it's supposed to be a device that tested all these yeah, kinds it, of levels yeah. of your blood. How do you get that far? <laughs> In the equities market, it's just it's bullish. It feels good to be bullish, right? I mean, no one wants to bet against America. No one, well, these days. That's the underlying fabric of the equities or the U.S. stock market is everyone wants to be wake up and see green, right? Doesn't it feel better when you watch Nine News or wherever you get your news, and they're like, "Today the markets were uh, busted all the all time high." Doesn't it just make you feel like, "Yeah, we're in good times right now." I think that's what we're seeing in the equities market. The COVID it was a dip, but it, what I love about the markets is. Everyone saw that dip and they just thought it was a great buying opportunity. I love that too. Right? It's like 
that makes me feel good. It's the capitalist that mentality. people still believe yeah. in. And then you know we got these riots untouched, equities markets like untouched. Not that they don't believe in the message or that there is a systemic issue, but they believe in the long term, the long haul, that America will be great and it will continue to be great. We just have some issues to work out. It's just like a, I guess, successful marriage, right? You had an argument, but you know, long term, you're in it for the long haul. And that's what I love about the markets. You know, some people are like, I, I guarantee there's people that were shorting through this. It's still short and they're still just can't believe it. And the, that's the squawk you're hearing. This is just crazy. And, you know, I've even caught myself being like, well, this just seems like a giant bubble to me. But the more I peel the onion back, people are optimistic, right? They're optimistic. America's restarting again. Why wouldn't you be bullish? Restarting uh, in consumer spending. People have been locked up. People have. We've talked about it. I mean, how many people? I went out and bought. Lots of furniture because I couldn't buy any furniture for so long. Right. But these it's are not, big purchases. It's not just that, right? The clothes, restaurants, haircuts, expendable income, alcohol. Um, alcohol really didn't take a dip. But man, when I went down to Florida, bar alcohol is going to go right. Up. Uh, I, keg consumption is going to go up. You know, I, I think everyone is hopefully, I'm hoping. Everyone got a taste of what could be taken away and they're going to really respect it. I hope. And hopefully they'll be saving too. Sectors. One of the ways to see what's going on is to look at companies that are grouped in sectors. One of the things that I follow, one of the sectors that I follow is the travel. Travel. The, the airline industry and hotels. Because to me, that's indicative of what's going on that I can't see because I don't live by a hotel and I don't live by an airport. The airline industry is up 45.6% in the last 30 days after being down. It's still down 46% year to date. That's massive, but that's good. It's encouraging. And 11.4% today, it's up. The well, think about the airline industry, okay? There is no alternative other than driving. Trains, which, ships, walking. Yeah, but biking, dude, lift. no one considers that the same. It's it, become like it's, not. it's become like the iPhone or the phone. When I was twenty one, a phone was a luxury. It was optimal. Right, it's like I could live with it or without it. Well, we grew up in the day of the Zach Morris brick phone. Today, you can't live with that. Like, business. Do you, do you remember the phone. Obama years where he was coming up with uh, programs to give homeless people phones? Because yeah, like it, this is a this is a like a human right. The Obama phone. Yep, and we paid for it. Yep. I mean, that's where we've come as society. Like, the phone goes in the bathroom with me. The that's phone. Di that's disgusting. I remember the red BlackBerry that Obama had and the black Blackberry that Obama had. And that had to do with the sensitivity of the subject so, of communication. Well, he had two different phones. I well, right. Know. One would have been top secret, whatever. Like the red phone was top secret. Whatever it was. And then the black phone was just day-to-day -day business. But the hotel sector is 25.42% up in the last 30 days, well, which I mean, is pe awesome. People are trying to catch the bottom. And that's interesting because remember, Airbnb had a serious level of layoffs. And that's, of course, the competition of the hotel industry. See, that surprises me because like Airbnb, how many employees do they really have? Customer service. Thousands. But it's a whole infrastructure, dude. Just in the last day, up 2.28% the hotel industry. But year to date, 22.63% down. This is important on those two, air travel and hotels, because foreign money is getting exchanged. So it's interesting to see how it correlates to the strength of the dollar 
in the strength of our, our largest travelers, the, the euro, the British pound, and the yen. Yeah, I mean, being in the hospitality business, I mean, everyone I know, they're hurting. But they know it'll bounce back. But I always kind of look at hospitality as a really good indicator of the economy. Is that what I just said? Didn't I just In a say roundabout that? way. All right. You didn't really put the needle to the record. I can't do the whole show for you, dude. <laughs> because hospitality, here's why. When businesses are doing well and they have extra income, they book retreats. They book business meetings. Conventions. Conventions, which is going to correlate with airfare and, and all the other things, right? Then you have... Clayton takes his family on vacations only if I have extra income, right? And then hospitality is a, is a luxury expense. So it is a, it's like the head of the spear of the economy. The hard part is it's a slow recovering one. And, you know, a lot of people are talking about five to six years, hotels are back where they were. However, as a long term investor, by Marriott, where it's at today, which, again, a Marriott is almost like a Boeing. It's not going to die. It's not a bad long-term investment. 104.82 Thursday night. 104.82 per share. Buying Marriott, it's not a bad long-term play. I don't think they're going to go away. And uh, hospitality will rise again. I do think... The best sector it would probably be banks. I think financial sector is a really good buy right now. A lot of the fears of that industry are kind of going wayside. You know, people going back to work, businesses taking loans. I think the stimulus fears are a little bit over. I'm sorry, JP Morgan Chase is a bullish. You know, that's a bullish buy all the time. So hopefully we've opened your minds to just, you know, outside of just focusing on getting your trading account. I mean, if you're early in your trading career, obviously getting consistent, getting those gains is, is the goal. But once you get there, you got to have a plan with what you're going to do once you've reached that level of this is as, pretty much as high as I want to uh, have my trading account. What I would love for you guys to do now that I got my new office up and running soon when I get my computer back, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put a lot of energy into the YouTube channel. I'd love for you guys to jump over to the YouTube channel. Matt will put a link in the show notes. I'm going to put a lot of free content on there. And also jump on over to allenfx.com, fill out the form. You're going to get into our email funnel where you're going to get all of Matt's wonderful newsletters each week which are getting pretty witty and funny by the way thanks and then uh you're gonna get email blasts only when we're putting out new content like these training courses that are coming up free videos once i got all these courses done shot edited i'm gonna be spending a lot of time on free content for those people that are in that funnel so don't miss out run on over and then tell all of your friends about the show. We'd love to have more listeners. Thank you very much for listening. Please join us next week. Over and out. If you'd like to learn more about Clayton's signals, please visit www.alanfx.com. You can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and Telegram at OFP.